Hello, and welcome to the Being Human podcast, where we explore what it means to truly be human, physically, mentally, and spiritually. We upload an episode of this podcast every single week, so hit that subscribe button. You do not want to miss any of these episodes. On this episode of the podcast, I sat down with Adam James Pollock. Adam is a writer, a chef, and what I would call a modern day philosopher. Adam lives in Ireland. He studied at Durham University in England, so he's a very educated man, and he's travelled multiple places all over the world, so he's a very cultured man. I first came across Adam on Twitter, or X as it's now called, where Adam shares a lot of his home cooking. Adam cooks delicious meals that he makes from scratch. He's very conscious about the ingredients he uses, the methods he uses to cook, and he looks to create healthy meals that are also indulgent and taste great. I asked him a lot about his approaches to cooking, his principles. I asked him the best way to cook eggs, the best pan to cook eggs in, because I'm terrible at cooking eggs myself. I asked him whether he cooks with seed oils or not, and where he stands on whether they're innocently toxic for you or they're completely fine to cook with. I asked him for the ingredients that are complete must-haves for him to have in his pantry or fridge, and a whole other host of cooking questions. I also asked Adam a lot of questions about culture and the way we live today in society. I asked him why our societies are so unhealthy and unhappy. I asked him about why our generation isn't interested in art anymore and the importance of art in the world and in our lives. I asked him a great deal of questions about life in general and we of course capped off the conversation with the traditional question here on Being Human of what is the meaning of life? Adam has great perspectives. I agree with him on a lot of what he has to say. I think he's really on the money when it comes to human health and living, what's missing from our lives today and how we should be living. He's a very intelligent guy and I do not doubt you're going to garner a great deal of value from listening to him today. If you do enjoy the conversation, please be sure to hit that subscribe button, like, comment, share the video as well. Thank you for watching, thank you for listening and thank you for supporting being human why do most people's home cooking suck <laughs> um people never learn in the first place um it's not as easy as just you know put a thing on the heat and then eat it like that'll work but it's the same with every sort of hobby or interest you know the dunning kruger effect is like in full swing with it you think you know everything as soon as you've started and the more often you do it you realize oh, actually hold on there is a whole science around this. Like it takes a lot of time and a lot of effort to actually get to a good level. Um, people just don't really have the time or the effort or know where to start. I think. When did you start cooking? Was it something you were brought up with or something you chose to develop later on? In life? Yeah, no, I, I definitely wasn't brought up with good food. Um, sort of the usual things that people eat in Ireland and in the UK, like roast dinners, um, chili con carne, spag ball, all this sort of thing. That's like my childhood food, nothing extraordinary. Um, I sort of, I got more into it at university because we were hosting and attending like dinner parties quite often. And it was always a bit embarrassing if you would go around to someone's with all your friends for dinner and they just don't know how to cook. And I found myself in that position once or twice and I was like, okay, I should actually make an effort. I should look into this and have like one or two things that I can make for a lot of people that, you know, are okay. I think it started with like a roast because that's lots of small bits that are easy to do. It's just like a time management thing. And then I think lasagna or bolognese or something, things that there's lots of documentation about that's easy to follow and pretty hard to go wrong with. Um, But yeah, I I finished uni just as COVID was starting, so it sort of upended life a bit, moved back to Northern Ireland, and then, well, I was stuck in the house all day, didn't have a job lined up or anything at this point, so I thought, you know, I'll save myself from eating bad food all the time, and just sort of learn how to do this, and cooked my own meals um, every day, still do, like, 90% of the time, so yeah, lots and lots of time. Where did you go to university and what were you studying to be going to dinner parties? Uh, I was at Durham University, North East England. Oh, okay. I didn't know that. 
I, I did business and management, so not the most um, social of degrees. Didn't really speak to many people on my course. Wasn't very like academically intense, but it's a collegiate university. The same as like Oxford or Cambridge or everything. So you're in a social setting with like 100 to 250 people, depending on what your college is. Eat all your meals together. You know, I had a roommate in my first year. So it sort of encourages you once you leave the halls after the first year to sort of have that relationship. You know, you're used to eating with people. You're used to, you know, spending most of your life with them. So they just sort of evolved from that. Yeah, uh, Durham is a, a prestigious university. I mean, behind Oxford and Cambridge, it's maybe the third best university in the country. So that makes a lot of sense. Um, conversely, I went to De Montfort University in Leicester, which is a former polytechnic. So uh, weren't many, and I studied law. So even studying law there, there weren't many dinner parties. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> not, not for me, because I stayed at home. But it was a lot of, uh, I imagine the students there were doing baked beans on toast and that kind of cuisine oh there was still a, there was still a lot of that it wasn't dinner parties every night but yeah <laughs> jars of pasta were the savior for a while so you actually kind of came into cooking fairly recently then if it was yeah. just coming up to covid so about four years ago yeah from looking watching consuming all your content on twitter you've reached a point where well, from my layman's perspective you're quite an advanced cook uh, a very good cook obviously i haven't had the pleasure thank you thanks but just from a, a look standpoint and how you speak about it you definitely come across as though you know what you're talking about and that you make delicious meals what principles do you use across the board when it comes to your cooking what philosophies almost do you apply in terms of health but then also as well, the methods to get the best taste out of foods. Yeah, so the one that I'm trying to do, I'll start with the first point about um, health and ingredients and that sort of thing. I fell into a bit of a rut probably last year with just sticking to what I know best. Like I know how to do like pasta meals with whatever sort of ingredient, just following the same basic recipe, but it gets a bit repetitive. Um, that's the thing with home cooking. And that's why I think it's quite a lot of people off is boredom and repetition it gets to a stage where you're not necessarily cooking for fun it's more like meal prepping in a way um so i've sort of tried to change that this year with every week i don't i don't really do like new year's resolutions but i suppose it's kind of like that every week when we do the shopping i'll pick an ingredient that i don't usually cook with and then i'll try and figure out how to incorporate that into meals you know so i'll just do looking at other recipes figuring out what i already know and trying to incorporate that into it and it's not always like exotic ingredients or anything it's just things that i personally don't eat much of like tender stem broccoli not something i usually eat but i bought that recently um cavolo nero kale use it in some things don't really eat it in much so i thought i'd figure out how to get that like red cabbage pretty things that you can get like everywhere but you know the grocery stores are full of ingredients that most people just walk past so it's a case of these things exist some people buy them sometimes that's why they're in the shops so they must be okay just lift one figure out what to do with it after the fact um that's sort of where i'm at as far as ingredients go and figuring out what to make at the minute but as far as what i would do you know most times when i cook i think one of the key things that people miss well two but they sort of go hand in hand is Firstly, not enough salt in food. People are really, really scared of salt, um, especially when it comes to things like pasta or potato or stuff that you usually cook in water or in large volumes. Um, people still just add like little pinches of salt because we all grew up hearing, you know, salt is really bad for you and it can be. But if you're boiling, you know, five liters of water to cook your pasta in and you want the pasta to taste like a little bit of salt, you need to put a lot more in because it's the volume of water that you're salting and then that transfers to the pasta. So it's a case of ratios with that sort of thing. Um, and that goes hand in hand with the thing that most people miss quite a lot. I've seen this with experienced home cooks all the time. People don't taste food as they go along cooking. That's the only reason you know if it's going to turn out well is 
if you taste at various stages throughout it. Because if something's gone wrong at the very first step, you know, if you're like frying onions to make a bolognese and you've like burnt them a little bit, but you don't taste it, that burnt flavour is going to carry on up until the final product and it's going to ruin it no matter what. But if you taste it and you find out actually these aren't really that good, you can start again. You've lost maybe five or ten minutes, but it saves the meal. So. Yeah, I think they're two excellent points. I've got a, I would say, a good base understanding of nutrition um, through my own research. And salt is massively misunderstood. People demonise salt and think it's the, the cause of high blood pressure, which downstream it can be. Yeah. But a big part of it is that people are consuming a lot of salt and are not consuming enough of the other minerals to balance it out and have a, a, a balanced, comprehensive mineral profile. And as well, they're consuming so many processed sugars, vegetable oils, these kinds of things, which yeah. mess up their metabolism and metabolic functions functioning so much that then, yes, if you do have lots of salt, it can end up causing um, high blood pressure and issues with the kidneys. But ultimately, those kinds of things are a problem with salt retention rather than salt consumption. If your body's functioning properly, it'll be able to take in the sodium that it needs and then filter out any excess. Sodium. And I like that point as well about tasting cooking as you go along. That's something I definitely do not do myself. And why don't we do it? Because we see chefs all the time. You see Gordon Ramsay or, you know, Jamie Oliver. Obviously, they're two quite different chefs. But you, you always see the chefs tasting food as they go along. So I suppose that is a, a good top tip that we should implement if we do want our food to taste better. Obviously, you've already talked a bit about the ingredients that you use. I wanted to ask you two questions and I'll ask them together. Your top five meals at the moment that you like to cook on. Yep. And the five must have ingredients for you to have in your pantry or fridge. Ooh. Okay. Top five meals. That's an interesting one. Um, my favorite at the minute, because this is the new one that I've sort of discovered. Um, since doing this whole one new ingredient a week thing braised red cabbage as part of a roast dinner is my favorite tasting thing at the minute i absolutely love it um essentially braise it in like sort of semi-sweet red wine like a cheap malbec or something bit of red wine vinegar butter sugar cook that for a couple of hours it is absolutely delicious um I've started doing it maybe like once a week or once a fortnight whenever I have like a big sort of substantial meal. It's yeah, really, really good. Aside from that, um, big fan of carbonara always have been. It's the one that I can do and it just sort of it works every time I've done it that much. I think it's the first sort of thing I actually wrote a recipe about on Twitter years ago. Um, big fan of carbonara. The ingredients are expensive. That's the only bad thing with it. Um, shakshuka love love doing shakshuka like eggs sort of poached in a tomato sauce again really simple to do but so tasty what else would there be hmm. i mean it's hard to know at the minute because so much of my cooking is oriented around what can i cook and then write about so my favourite ones, I tend not to repeat that much. Otherwise, I would go days without having something to talk about. Big fan of, um, I got actually quite a bit of stick for it on, on Twitter. Caldo Verde is like a Portuguese soup, literally translates as green soup. But I posted it and it has like a chorizo in it. And the spices from the chorizo leached into the soup. So that combined with the filter I put on the thing made it look more like browny red than green. And there was just a bunch of Portuguese people going off in my replies being like, that's not caldo verde, but tastes good. Looks more green in real life before you add the, the chili. But yeah. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm a big fan of all of those. And as someone that's consumed your content on Twitter for a couple of years now, the carbonara especially has been mm. a big, I'd say repeat offender, not an offender at all. Yeah. Yeah. yeah a repeated feature and uh, I, I actually made a carbonara myself once in the first lockdown and I mean in comparison to yours I'm sure it pales but I was surprised at how not easy but how well mine turned out I mean I can cook but I'm not 
uh, an experienced or advanced chef by any metric. But uh, yeah, I think that's a, it's, a good recipe for everyone to try. It's a good one in that even if it goes wrong, like the one thing that can go wrong with carbonara that still happens to me, you know, every now and again is the heat's just a bit too high when you add the egg, so it scrambles a bit. But worst case scenario, you have cheesy scrambled egg with nice meat and lots of pepper like it's still gonna taste good it's just not gonna look exactly what it's like so it's it's definitely a good one for people to start with yeah and another thing that you put emphasis on and you mentioned this uh in relation to the carbonara in terms of the ingredients being expensive mm. where and how do you like to source your ingredients and how important is that to the taste but also the nutrition of the meal as well yeah, so we sort of have a balance between we go to different places for different sort of things. Um, we go to like the likes of like Lidl for spices and things like that that you can get like really cheaply there. Wouldn't buy vegetables there because one, they're not local and two, they're not good. For vegetables and stuff locally, we'll go to like Tesco or Marks and Spencers and stuff because you can get huge quantities of them for like cheap. The big stores also have loads of other things that, you know, come from this country, like Ireland, Northern Ireland are countries where there's such a high portion of like small scale family farmers. So there's so many people have tried different, you know, planting techniques with different vegetables and things. So there's always going to be a locally produced version of whatever you want there, whether it's, you know, common things like onions, potatoes or whatever to like asparagus, broccoli, you can get all this. Um, when it comes to meat and stuff, if I want to get like really high quality meat, I just go to the local butchers. Um, very fortunate there's a really good one near us because I used to live in Belfast, like in the city, and the butchers there kind of just function as meat shops. They buy all the meat in. You don't really know the provenance of it. You don't know where it's came from. And they don't really have as much knowledge as you would expect butchers to have as regards the cuts of meat and what they're selling. So... I remember anecdotally I went into one and asked for some beef short rib to braise it and the guy behind the counter just reached for like a rack of like pork ribs. I was like that's not even vaguely near what I'm asking for um, but they don't keep parts of the animal there that they can just go and slice a bit off for you. It's all bought in bulk but we have a good butcher locally to us that, you know, it's all locally grass fed reared cows um, that you can just get the stuff from, which is great. A good sort of test that I would have to figure out is a butcher actually worth going to is if they sell like pre-shaped burger patties, ask them what cuts of meat go into them. And if they don't know, they've just bought them in bulk and you probably shouldn't buy your meat from them because everything's going to be like that. Yeah, that, that's a really good tip. I like that one. Um, I'm really blessed to have a farm shop literally right around the corner from me that does that raises you know all of its own cows, pigs, chickens. They're all pasture. The chickens are pasture raised, so the eggs are pasture raised. The cows are grass fed. These are some things that some people think don't have a big impact. For me, I think mm. it has a massive impact on the taste, but on the nutritional quality as well. I think the science is out there for it from what I've seen. And yeah, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a big believer in the quality of the food will dictate the quality of the meal and the quality of your health as a result of that. So I, I, I always encourage people if they're able to access proper butchers, experienced butchers, like you said, and farm shops where the quality of the meat's good and they really know what they're talking about. I just think it makes a night and day difference to how your meal is going to turn out and how they're going to impact ultimately. Yeah, and obviously it does come with a price premium if you're paying for higher quality stuff, but it is one that if you're sort of aiming for health and it's something that you're just looking into, by the time you cut out all the processed foods that you've already been buying and stuff, once you've already stocked up on, you know, the spices, the herbs, all this, you know, pantry staples and that sort of thing, it, you're not going to be spending that much like our it always amazes people when i say um how much our weekly shop costs because it's really not that much that's why I, I wrote the weekly shop cookbook a couple of years ago it's a little thin pamphlet but it was like 30 pounds for a home-cooked lunch and a home-cooked dinner for two people 
for seven days of the week for 30 pounds and I shared it I shared the receipt in the thing and I posted it on Twitter to promote it and everyone just accuses you of lying because there's such a disconnect people are like well I I you know we're a family of three and we spend like 150 pounds a week in Tesco's I'm like what are you buying like look in, look into that plan your meals ahead figure out what you actually need to make those and everything else you know you could reduce it yeah that, that's another good point obviously when you buy 40 ingredients they do they they cost more no, no one can deny that a grass yeah. steak from your local butcher or your local farm shop is going to cost more than a steak from tesco but when you cut out going through the McDonald's drive through two days a week and, you know, another meal that's pretty unhealthy for you and it's pretty mediocre, you start going out for that or you start ordering that takeaway, it balances out and yeah. you've got a much healthier meal, a meal that's much more fulfilling, not only because it tastes great, hopefully, um, if it's turned out well, but you've cooked mm-hmm. it yourself. And there's something very fulfilling to that. I suppose, yeah, talk to me about that. What kind of fulfillment do you get from cooking your own food as opposed to ordering in, go, even going out to eat, which has its own special uh, place and yep. benefit, of course. But yeah, talk to me about that. Yeah, um, I think for me now, it's slightly skewed because obviously there's like a sort of financial element to it where in my head there's like the little gratification that comes with a financial incentive for continuing to do this so it's kind of up to the stakes a little bit for me where you know every time I cook a little bit of my brain's going like the money is going to come back into this when I share it when I promote the books and that sort of thing but even before I, I'd written the book you just you feel better about yourself having made food yourself even if it's not like a healthy meal you still feel like you're eating healthier because you don't have to like drive somewhere queue up and get your food sit down in there with lots of like screaming kids and bring it or bring it back home sit on the sofa in front of the tv and eat that like it feels like more of an actual process that gets you involved you know with where your food came from what ingredients you're using like you feel much more connected to it as a thing and Along with that, I always sort of encouraging like sit at the table and don't be on your phones whenever you're eating. Um, I think it's very, very important for, especially if you have like a partner or a family or something, it's really, really important not to just zone out when it comes to eating. Like think about what you're eating and spend that time because that's, well, firstly, things taste better when you think about them. And secondly, it's good to connect over something um like food is great at bringing people together that's what, why i first started cooking in the first place and it's a shame that people are losing out on that definitely and i'm guilty of that my brother calls it the double dopamine sitting down in front of the tv yeah. with a you know a how would i describe it an indulgent meal and watching <laughs> his favorite netflix series yeah says to me like stop doing it stop stop binging on the double dopamine just sit down and enjoy your meal and the thing is when I you know if someone gifts me like my friend last year gifted me uh, a really nice cut of steak for my birthday and my birthday's in the summer so I cut the steak and I went out into the garden and just sat in the garden and really was just present as I ate it and you know a good steak it takes a lot of time to eat I sat there for maybe the best part of an hour savoring this and it was such an enjoyable tranquil deep experience versus I could have just grabbed it sat in front of the tv and I would have had a great time like I said indulging in the double dopamine but it's it's such a different experience and well this is something I I really agree with whether it's a home-cooked meal or if you go out somewhere to eat the way that people connect when it comes to food, when you share food with one another, is something that's very special. And to me, it makes perfect sense because the best part of the day before societal living, before any kind of technology, any kind of technology or advancement in humanity, the best part of our days when together is would be building that campfire, cooking a meal around it together and then sharing it together around that campfire so there's something incredibly special about that and I think yeah it was it was a reward initially like you were rewarding yourself at the end of the day of actually like 
being able to secure your food for the day. So I still think there's a part of us that's linked to that in a way that it sort of fuels our you know reward system and we feel gratified both like in terms of society like you feel full but also you feel quite happy that you've achieved something. Definitely. Going back to the topic of ingredients from both a taste and nutrition perspective, talk to me about cooking oil, cooking fats. Where do you lie on the <laughs> controversial topic of seed oils? I know yeah. where you lie already, but I'll <laughs> hear you articulate. Yeah, um, I don't cook with them in the house. I don't think there is any need to, really. Um, it's hard to avoid them when it comes to restaurants. That's the one thing that still there's a lot of work to be done. Um, you can change it depending on what restaurant you go to. Like whenever we go out to eat most, we go to this like really nice Neapolitan pizza chain in our country. Um, because I know how proper Neapolitan pizza is made and you don't really need oil in it. So that's one way that you can, you know, avoid it and stuff. But if you're going to, you know, proper like actual restaurants, they will be using it. That's just something that you have to accept. But you can mitigate that a lot when it comes to the house. Um, People love saying that, you know, you can only like fry in seed oils or vegetable oils or whatever, but it's just not really true. And you can hit people with the science and whatever about it, but the only reason or the only time they'll actually listen to you is if they try it and it works and you end up with a nice meal at the end of it. Like when it comes to like deep frying or like frying chicken or anything like that, you, you still don't even need to do it. Like... I know it's going to be more expensive again it comes to the premium for like higher ingredients and things but you can fry things in other oils it's just going to cost more but there's smarter ways around it you know you can use less oil if you use a different shaped pan you know if you use like a small circumference pan that's taller you can fit a bit of chicken into it with using less oil than if you had like a big pan and filled it up a bit and dropped the chicken into it it's going to cook differently again because, you know, it depends on the surface area that's in touch with things. But there are ways around it. It's definitely not an ingredient that you need to have or use in the house. Yeah, again, for me, like I said, I've delved into the science on it. The problem with nutritional sciences and, and the way that studies are published and, and brought to us is that there's a study for everything. So I understand that people say, oh, well, there's just as many studies that say, you know, seed oils are healthy for you as unhealthy. But from my perspective, again, going back to the evolutionary approach, things like beef fat, you know, chicken fat, fats from meat, butter, coconut oil, even these are fats that we've used so much longer than these oils that have been manufactured in the past 50 years. And the the thing I always, the, to me, the definitive statement is that I always use McDonald's have advertised on the side of their trucks, we recycle our cooking oil as biodiesel. They're literally telling you, yeah. cooking your food in petrol. Yeah, I, I, I've <laughs> seen this that, before. I've pointed it out to people and it's like, do you really want to be eating something that your car can run on? Is it, There's a disconnect that, that just doesn't feel right. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. For me, I, I just don't think you need a study to to tell you that these yeah. oils aren't good for you. Um, so what is your what are like your let, let yeah let's say your top three oils then. Um, if you want to say one for frying, one for roasting, if you want to break it down like that, by all means do so. But what are your top three oils that you like to use for cooking? Yeah, um, butter, olive oil, beef fat, easy. Um, butter I use on like low heat cooking and if i'm doing vegetables apart from italian cuisine i'll use um butter so frying onions and butter it's great if i'm doing like beef smash burgers butter perfect wouldn't roast in it because it'll just burn quite quickly and a large portion of butter is obviously water so it's just gonna steam and cook things with steam rather than like actually frying them if you do it in a certain way so butter's great, tastes the best, I think, but it's sort of limited in the applications. Um, for all Italian cooking, I use olive oil because I'd get crucified if I didn't. It tastes good. Um, I recommend a couple of different kinds of olive oils for different things. So, so you have super premium, 
extra virgin olive oil costs quite a lot it tastes great there is absolutely no point buying that and frying with it you're not going to get the flavors through keep that for like drizzling over bruschetta or you know serving or anything like that but you can get much cheaper extra virgin olive oil just get the tesco own brand one get one that's certified to not be adulterated with any other oils you know you can still trace the producer but get the cheaper version if you're going to be frying with it there's no point using the expensive one for it um and beef fat if i'm doing stuff in the oven if i'm doing roast potatoes some vegetables beef fats over the only way um the taste just works so well especially if you're having like a roasted meal with that that's what i use that for what's the best pan for cooking eggs i ask this because i feel like it's something everybody wants to know but no one needs this more than me because i am so terrible at cooking eggs i've tried it in cast iron i've tried it in stainless steel it always just sticks for some reason no matter how much butter i use what's your process for cooking eggs well depends on the sort of egg um people will say that scrambled eggs you can't do them not in a non-stick pan i don't own a non-stick pan you can do them absolutely fine in stainless steel or carbon steel but you will have to clean up a bit it's very difficult to avoid like a little bit of sticking unless you like maniacally just stir constantly forever on the heat then you can avoid it but it sticks a little bit to it and that's just the case of it it's a bit of a nightmare to clean if you're doing fried eggs um cast iron absolutely all the way the heat that comes with the cast iron it, i think is just perfect for it bit of butter crack the egg well i usually crack eggs into ramekins and then pour them in just so it's like a bit more together but when the heat sort of like crisps up the bottom of the egg that creates a layer it's like when you're like seasoning the cast iron the way it burns the oil onto it it sort of solidifies the bottom layer of the egg so it can't really stick so you need like a high enough heat and a good substantial amount of oil or butter when it comes to fried eggs i want to transition now a bit more into when i say the health side of things we obviously talked about health but in a more holistic sense why are our society so unhealthy and unhappy? Ooh, so that is a loaded question. Um, happiness, I don't... People chase things in either days and try and orient their lives around things that they think will gratify them, that it's really short term, it's not going to, you know, satisfy you in the long term. But as a people now we're so geared towards short-term things because the long term is so uncertain for most people you know young people especially like people our age the dream of owning a house is something that may or may not happen now people have sort of gravitated away from having children we know the birth rates falling and that sort of thing so when you take out these things that traditionally were like what all humans went towards on a long term like it wasn't even a goal it was just expected then it sort of has to be replaced with these manufactured short-term things that they're all just being capitalized on by organizations as a way to you know fry the dopamine receptors and get money by making you addicted to them that's what social media is for television even work to an extent you know work people obsess over it nowadays and i sort of struggle with the idea that having your job your career as the main for focus in your life i don't really agree with that i think it should be something that's important and something you like put a lot of thought and time into because you're going to be spending a large portion of your waking hours doing that job but it shouldn't be the most important thing and i just feel like the way people are sort of geared towards what they like or what they want to achieve nowadays doesn't really doesn't really lead to long term happiness, especially when I think about, you know, what are these people going to be like when they're old? Um, will they have people to care for them if they can't walk? Will they have to pay a stranger to do it? Will they have family around? It's quite sad in a way, I think. Yeah, it definitely is. I, I think it's quite a, a bleak picture at the moment when we look at where we're headed, um, or it is uh, from my perspective anyway. But that's a that's a great point, I think. So many people now live to work when really 
you should be working to live. Ideally, your job, your career will be something that brings you a great deal of fulfillment and it shouldn't have to feel like work a lot of the time. Obviously, that's not going to be a reality for everybody. So for those people that it isn't, I think that mindset is critical to having a filled and happy life. You shouldn't be feeling as though you're living just to work and that work's your number one priority. You should be seeing it as a means to an end to get whatever money, whatever wealth you need in order to live the life that you want to live and do the things that you want to do. I think that's imperative and I think we've really lost sight of that. So to reverse engineer it, how do we reclaim our health physically, mentally, and I say spiritually, spiritually, emotionally, that way? How do we how do we attack that problem? Yeah, I think key is having good relationships with people. Um, people will say nowadays, you know, they, they have lots of friends and stuff. Quite often, these are like surrounded other activities that you just sort of do a thing with the people you know going out clubbing working with them and that sort of thing but there needs to be like deeper relationships whether it's with a partner whether it's with family with friends that you like spending the time with them doesn't really matter what you're doing what you're talking about because that's sort of the only way to actually cultivate a support network that will meet all your needs and um, people need to pay more attention i think to selecting partners and stuff don't go about it willy-nilly actually understand what your long-term goals are try and match these with someone else and if they don't overlap it's a waste of time really um so i think people are the key sort of before health in that way and then it's a case of just removing yourself from situations and places that you don't feel like help you mentally whether that's what we did at the minute like leaving the city and moving to somewhere a bit more rural you know it's quieter you see less things that annoy you things like this like nobody really is stuck you know people have to say oh i live you know i live here because my work's here well you can change both of those things people will be like oh i can't have commitments here my family's here there's ways around it there's ways that you can do things you know i still work in the city you know i have to go there four or five days a week usually it's a bit of an effort it's not great especially when it comes to winter and stuff and you know you leave the house it's dark you don't get home until it's dark you can't really enjoy the countryside as such or whatever but it's still better than being in the city you know street lights cars people outside your window all hours of the day Yeah, before we started recording, we were actually talking about city living and our experiences living in cities. And from my perspective, again, it's it's night and day. If, if I was still in a position where I had to work in a city with the job I had, I, I would do the same thing as you by any means necessary. I, I'd do whatever I could to stay in the countryside and commute in, even if that means a longer day, four or five days a week, to then be able to have a sound night's sleep without hearing yeah. people partying in the streets cars going by and being able to just walk out my door and have a walk in the countryside on the weekends talk to me about our countrysides um do, do you notice much of a difference actually geographically speaking between english countryside and irish countryside or are they kind of the same biggest difference is architectural entirely um well where I am in um, South Down, County Down, um, it's very hilly. We have lots of tiny hills, so everything sort of goes like this. Whereas my experience of England, you don't really have that. Yes, you have hills, you have downs, that sort of thing, but they're all sort of big, larger, grander, you know, geographical features. But the main difference is architectural. Um, the English countryside and the buildings that are found in it so much better than what we have here. Generally. Part of it, I think, is because of the stone that's used in certain places. I love like English sandstone. I think it looks absolutely beautiful. We don't really get it here. We import like red sort of sandstone <coughs> type things from Scotland that we used to build buildings with. But as well, because it was a much poorer country here um, historically, all the old houses weren't looked after, weren't cared for, and were sort of replaced in the 50s, 60s, 70s and 80s with just bungalows. 
So most of what you'll see in the countryside now are just relatively small, like one story houses. That's really interesting. I've never actually been to Ireland, as in Southern Ireland or Northern Ireland myself. It looks incredibly beautiful. I'm very much into climbing mountains and Ireland's obviously got some fantastic ones. So I look forward to exploring those at some point. Yeah, absolutely. Wicklow is beautiful. Wicklow is a good place. Many people today, well, they're not interested in a lot of the things we've spoken about already, but another thing is art. Our generation, I, I can't really converse with many people at all on the topic of art. Why do you think people aren't interested in art anymore? And why should they be? Why is art important? Yeah, I think a lot of the contemporary idea of what art is is people view it as exclusive in a way where there's always you know a deeper meaning to get from something and on the surface it doesn't have to be beautiful i feel like that's that's a mistake when it comes to actually getting um like popular interest in art because not everyone's going to look at a painting and get the deeper meaning you know that's all well and good if you sort of know what to look for or you're good at interpreting your surroundings or art or that sort of thing but even if a painting just looks nice if there's a deeper meaning to it not everyone's going to get it but if it looks nice people can still appreciate that you know people if you go into like the average older person's house like middle-aged old they have like these sort of pictures or photographs that they've just bought in the shop and hung on the wall that they think look nice. There's not going to be a deeper meaning to them most of the time, but they just like the look of them, so they put them up there. You don't really tend to get that with things that you'll walk into, like, say, the Tate Modern, and see these, you know, paintings that look a bit odd or sculptures or whatever. It's not something that the average person will look at and be like, isn't that lovely? Um, it might have a meaning that it conveys that's important, but first and foremost, if it's not something that, like, sparks joy, it's not going to be you know, something that has mass appeal. And I feel like that's led to a lot of people not really caring about quite a lot of artistic mediums. Obviously, there, there's things like films, TV shows, literature that still forms of art that are still doing well. But as far as, you know, paint, photography, that sort of thing, that's where the problems are. Yeah, I, I think that's maybe the reason why, actually, in terms of the reference to cinema, films, TV. Maybe that's why people aren't interested in more traditional forms of art anymore, because they've been replaced with these forms of art that are just able to grab our attention and keep our attention much more easily. They're, they're, they're just engineered to be able to, to grasp our attention, and that attention span is just getting shorter and shorter and almost more passive in terms of TikTok reels. We just keep getting shown something that an algorithm has figured out is just going to be instantly pleasing to us. And with a lot of paintings, old photographs, maybe on first impression, it doesn't really do much for you. You have to spend time actually looking at it and maybe going into the history of it a bit for it to actually invigorate you and to get that feeling of gratification from consuming it. Yeah, and again, it's not something that people want to put their time into, you know. <clears throat> especially people who you know they have a long day they work hard all day they come home they want to relax and they don't feel like relaxing should be a process you have to invest yourself in it should be something that sort of happens to you i feel like that's where we've sort of gone as a society that relaxing is passive rather than active i kind of have like an active form of realize relaxation i relax by doing things whether that's cooking going for a walk you know writing that's how i wind down um most people it's more passive now what do you find writing does for you what kind of things do you like to write about and what benefit do you gain from it yeah um clarity of thought and more often than not makes me well first learn something new but realize i don't know as much as i initially thought um it's kind of like a form of, I don't want to say like humility, but sort of grinding myself in that I've only ever written about things when 
I'll read something, whether it's, you know, about cooking or anything else I've written about art, the countryside, architecture, whatever. I'll see something, disagree with it just intuitively, and then want to write something to sort of prove my point. But in the writing process, I realize actually I have a lot more to learn about this. So it's a way of sort of humbling yourself by realizing nobody knows everything and there's always much more to discover. But people don't really want to read things that disagree with their own views. So if you have this view, read more about it that sort of proves your point, gives opposite views. And then if there's an opposite view you come across that you think, actually, that's quite good. Then it's another mental exercise to figure out what is it that I actually disagree with this about if I can hold my original view. So it's kind of a way to just figure out what your thoughts are on things a bit more, I think. Yeah. I agree. And for me, something I always advocate, advocate, sorry, for people to do is to read things that you think before you read them you are going to disagree with and you're not going to like because I think if we always read and consume media that is instantly appealing to us again not say that we're not going to gain benefit from it but if you're unaware that you're heading down the wrong path or a path that's maybe not as beneficial as you think it is a path that's not as truthful as you think it is then all you're going to end up doing is confirming confirming over again this bias which ultimately isn't leading you where you need to go so I think it's always important to have those checks in place and for me reading things that I disagree with or think I'm going to disagree with is one of them and I think that's another one as well write write I would recommend everyone write even if they don't publish their writing you of course don't need to just journaling each day brings you so much clarity of mind and I definitely experience the same thing as well where I might be so consolidated in my idea of something and I start writing about it and then it actually opens up another door that I never thought about. I'm like, oh, actually, I could think about it this way. I could think about it this way. And it does just bring you a lot of clarity of mind. And if anybody kind of feels, though, as though they don't know what their internal constitution is, my recommendation would be, obviously, yes, you need to read more. So you have that knowledge in order to form your constitution, but a constitution needs to be written as well I think so that's a big part of why writing is so important to me mm -hmm. apart from the English constitution yes yeah and that's that's an excellent point actually yes. yeah yeah, yeah, as, yeah. A, as, a, as a law student previously yeah 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 the English constitution is one of the few constitutions in the world that isn't written and again that has its it's uh it's pros and cons it's it's main pro being flexibility and it's con being that that flexibility again it, it has benefits and its weaknesses but yeah not, not to say that you need to write down your constitution and keep it solidified i think it should always be evolving as as we evolve and again that's a, a potential negative of having a written constitution you see that problem in the united states um with gun laws there yeah. are mm -hmm. because it's written in the constitution and we can't touch the constitution so that shows the other side of the the train track so to speak yeah. Yeah. Well, that's one of, the, one of the reasons why I love Twitter as a medium. Definitely the best social media is because it's a written medium and you, you put your thoughts onto it. But if you see it as a way of using, you know, the general public or the audience as devil's advocate, challenging you in your thoughts, it's a great way to like sort of force self-improvement upon yourself because you're constantly having to justify yourself. In general, what do you find your audience to be like in terms of rationality and <laughs> uh, proper discussion of thoughts, let's say? Essentially, do you get many haters or is everyone pretty reasonable and cautious? Um, there's quite, I don't even know if you consider them haters or what, but there's quite a lot of insane people in the world and they just love riling people up. And I get that. I, I'll you know, post the odd inflammatory thing because I think it's funny, but I don't know what the ratios would be. There's definitely like a good 20% of people who engage with me who are actually just interested in learning more. I have lots of people who follow me because I just post nice pictures and they disagree with every single thing that I think or say, which is really interesting. I, there's a few people who just comment on everything I say and disagree with it, which is 
brilliant. Why do they still follow me? But it's funny. And then there's a lot of people that I've just sort of kind of curated these like mini internet friendships with, whether I've spoken to them in group chats over the period of time that just interact with most things what you say, will say something funny, you know, in joke references or whatever, which kind of, it's nice and adds to it, but then everyone from the outside will be seeing it and thinking, what on earth is that? What does it mean? Or why are you interacting with unsavory people or whatever? You're not responsible for who your audience is. That's one thing that I believe, you know, whoever replies to you or comments in your threads or whatever, that's up to them. It's not up to you to block people or any of that sort of thing. Um, I've sort of stopped blocking most people unless they just keep annoying me over and over again. If they're just a bit, you know, a bit dim or trying to be inflammatory for whatever, I just kind of retort or just let them get back on with it. I can see your bookshelf in the background. <laughs> we yeah. read books. What are three books that everyone should read? Three books that everyone should read. Um, first and foremost, the best book that I've read probably in the past year, two years, is The Leopard by Giuseppe de Lampedusa. Um, absolutely fantastic, kind of based on real things and especially pertinent as regards what recently happened with uh, Lampedusa, the Italian island recently, as far as immigration and things go. Definitely want to look into, very pertinent read, very interesting. Um, what else would there be? Another one I'm a big fan of <coughs> is The Glass Bead Game by Herman Hess. Really interesting. If, if you sort of view yourself as someone who likes a wide range of topics, always wanting to develop, you know, self-improvement is such a big thing nowadays. It's almost imperative, I would say, to kind of read this and think about it and figure out if you're actually working towards anything in particular. Do you have a goal with it or are you just doing it for the sake of it because you want to, like, reach the highest level in your life that's possible or whatever? And is the really lead to happiness it's a great book for trying to actually figure out what the meaning of that is and one other book what would i pick it would have to be some form of travel literature because that's sort of my favorite thing to read um the likes of rory stewart's the places in between or heinrich Hauer's seven years into bed Wilfred Thester's Arabian Sands, any one of those um, I'd recommend people reading. It's sort of any of these things which are about people interacting with cultures that they've never really come across, people they've never come across that don't have anything in common with them on the surface. It's great to realise that at a deeper level you can interact with people. They will more often than not show you a form of kindness if you present yourself to them openly. And sort of older travel literature is a good way of doing that. Rory Stewart's Places in Between is a great, probably the best example of that in a modern setting. It's sort of Afghanistan within the past couple of decades. So, Yeah, I saw that in your, I think it was in your Instagram bio, world champion glass bead <laughs> game player, yeah. things to that effect. And uh, I was like, that's interesting. I've never heard of a glass bead game before. <laughs> So <laughs> where it's from. Yeah, um, yeah. So, yeah, I'll, I'll have to I'll obviously note all of those down and add them to the reading list because I haven't read any of those, but I'm particularly intrigued by the glass bead game. In reference to travel, then. You, you're from Ireland. Studied in, uh, in England at Durham University. Other than that, how much have you traveled around and experienced other cultures and would you ever live? anywhere other than Ireland. Cool, yeah. Um, I've been to probably 20-ish countries, maybe a few more, I don't really know. Um, yeah, I've been quite a few places, been India, Morocco, quite a lot of Europe, um, Scandinavia, the United States. I'm going to, uh, what's it called, Finland. I'm going to Estonia this month in a couple of weeks' time. Um, I love going places. I love experiencing things that you can't really get anywhere. Um, 
I especially like going for like longer things that aren't necessarily just like a holiday. Um, so before I started university, I spent two months in Italy, just living in the north of Italy with a family I never met before um, under the guise of teaching their children English for like a couple hours of the day. But it was very much a you can go and do your own thing for most of the time. And I spent a few months in India, sort of part of it was working in like wildlife rehabilitation and that sort of thing. Large part of it was just sort of traveling around the north of it, India going to various stuff and um, it, it's great to see how the world develops in different ways depending on you know the culture the people that live there the religions what their beliefs are the government really really fascinating would I live anywhere else probably not um, I don't think I would live full-time in a country that isn't English speaking just because it's a lot easier to relate to people when you can understand absolutely everything they're saying and if you can understand what they're saying if it's a culture you've lived in you can understand what's not being said to you through body language through things unspoken that sort of thing that would be very difficult to learn in a different country um not to mention the fact that you know if you're in a relationship if you have family somewhere that kind of dictates your ties a lot more um, I'd definitely be open for like having a holiday home somewhere. I love Italy, I love Greece, um, but I don't think I, I'd move full time. A very well travelled man then. I'll have to come to you for travel tips. Italy is top of my list um, for where I want to spend a lot of time. So, so yeah, I'll have to ask you. We're, go we're going back in May. Um, going in May for a week to Como again where I used to live so that'll be a nice like revisit kind of thing. Oh beautiful I'm sure we pick up uh, some more cooking tips as well. <laughs> Hopefully. So a final uh, I'll say a final question two uh, questions to finish and they're both linked I suppose you post a lot of photos on Twitter with the caption I must live a certain way and I feel as though I know what you mean by that. But what is this way? What is this way that you must live? Consciously. Um, basically just being aware of everything you're doing and where it comes from. That's sort of it. Um, all the stuff we have in the house is all, you know, I, I have a rule where like don't use plastic in anything so in this room i'm sitting in there's nothing really that's made of plastic apart from well my Air airpods case um that but i like being surrounded by actual materials i feel like that sort of grounds you to the the place you are um who made them allows you to connect with people a lot more homemade food everything that's just more human in a way um whether it's what you consume digitally or food wise, what you sit on, where you are, the people you hang around with, I think it should be, you know, handmade or natural or authentic. Anyway. Again, I completely agree with that. And I love that one word answer that you used to start it off consciously. I think that's so important. And I think it's especially pertinent to how we live today. So I think the way the world works, we're so busy, we've got so much thrown at our minds, thrown in our faces that we've switched off. And who can blame us for all yeah. that we have to deal with, all that we're presented with? It's almost as though the only way to live within society and stay sane is to live unconsciously, switch off, go onto autopilot. But I think, and, and this has really been a running theme of this conversation we've had today, removing yourself from that. Is, is a healthy way to live so you can reclaim conscious living so I completely agree with you on that point and then as a final question off of the back of that what then is the meaning of life to you which I know is a big existential question mm. but yeah please answer um, that, uh, as it's kind of easier for me I'm a Christian so the meaning of life is just be good until the next one essentially um, treat people how you'd like to be treated and take care of things um, if you view the world as like a big project that everyone before you has contributed to you know you think of people who have left a mark politically in literature and architecture the built environment whatever I view it as minimize the negative impact you can have on that 
like you're just a caretaker of it for whoever's going to come after you. Um, so I think if you're irreligious, that's sort of the way to go for it. You know, see everything you do as a project, see the world as a project and try and leave it in a better state than you found it. That's a brilliant answer. Where can people go to keep up to date with what you're doing to learn new recipes and ultimately, in my opinion, live better? Cool. So, yeah, I'm on Twitter and Instagram, just Adam James Pollock, if you'd like to search. And my new book, Sustenance, A Guide to Good Food, is on Amazon, or you can find it on my social media. Thank you, Adam. I really appreciate you. This conversation was great. Uh, I think we share a lot of similar viewpoints, and I love what you're about. And I enjoy keeping up to your con with your content, sorry, and seeing what you continue to do. Thank you very much. Yeah, good chatting with you.